Welcome, everyone. We have a few reminders for you before we get started with today's webinar. Today's presentation, Interactive In-Person Training, will begin at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time. You are currently in listen-only mode. You should be able to hear us through your computer speakers. If you cannot hear us, please try a different browser, such as Google or Firefox or others. We will take questions at the end of this webinar using the chat box on the bottom left side of your screen. You will receive a certificate for attending this webinar for the entire hour. Certificates will be emailed to you on July 10th. You may need to check your spam folder for your certificate. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Francille Ikeji, and I'm a nutritionist with the Nutrition Education Training and Technical Assistance Division at USDA's Food and Nutrition Service in Child Nutrition Program. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Interactive In-Person Training. This webinar is part of Team Nutrition's quarterly webinar series, CACSP Trainer Circle. These webinars will be recorded and made available at a later date on the Team Nutrition website. We will have time at the end of this webinar to take questions. You can use the chat box on the bottom left corner of your screen at any time during the webinar to, to enter your questions. We will try to answer as many as we can at the end of the webinar. Today we will be hearing from Lucy Amos, who is a CACFP training specialist with the Maryland State Department of Education, and Linda Simmons, a nutrition specialist with the Texas Department of Agriculture. In fiscal year 2018, FNS awarded $3.7 million to 38 state agencies to support meal service training in the Child and Adult Care Food Program. Up to $100,000 was awarded to each state that applied, and these meal service training grants are assisting state agencies in providing job skills training for CACSC operators on ways to plan, prepare, and serve nutritious foods. We are excited to have two of our grantees presenting on some of the training strategies they are implementing in their meal service training grant. If by chance you still cannot hear us through your computer speakers, you can call in by phone using the information on the screen. Before we get into the presentations, we want to know who you are, so please select one of the following options listed on the slide here. Let us know if you are state agency staff who plan and implement CACSP training, government agency staff who develop training materials, community-based organization staff who plan and implement CACSP training, a CACSP sponsoring organization who provides training, a CACSP site operator who attends training and may train other staff, or another category. Great, it looks like we have a lot of sponsoring organizations, state agencies, and other folks with us today. Thank you for joining us, it's great to have you all here. I want to share a few updates from Team Nutrition. We recently launched a new online network for sponsoring organizations and independent child care centers currently participating in the Child and Adult Care Food Program. Similar to the Team Nutrition Schools Network, the Team Nutrition CACFP organizations will now have their own opportunities for receiving resources, idea sharing amongst each other, and more via this network. All sponsoring organizations and independent child care centers currently participating in CACSP 
can enroll via the Teen Nutrition website. Now from the home page of the Teen Nutrition CACFP Organizations Network, you can enroll in organizations through the Join Teen Nutrition CACSP Organizations option, search and find Enrolled Organizations, submit changes to keep contact information updated, download a Certificate of Enrollment, and visit our help page with two videos that showcase how easily the website can be navigated. You can also access the website from mobile devices. Team Nutrition CACSP organizations have the opportunity to request exclusive educational materials, like Team Nutrition's new Discover New Foods decal set, to promote healthy choices at meals, snacks, or any time. These decals, shown on your screen, are removable and can be repositioned on many different services. Also, the ever-popular Make Today a Tri-Day stickers are also available through promotion now. When you enroll as a Teen Nutrition CACSP organization, you're asked to indicate which nutrition and wellness activities take place at your site. On the screen, you can see the 10 activities with their corresponding icons. Once enrolled, each Team Nutrition CACSP organization will have the icon of the activities they've selected next to their contact information, which will help build and foster a community to share experiences and best practices around select topics. Users can also search the network by state and or city to find Team Nutrition CACSP organizations that are located in their region. Many of you may be familiar with Team Nutrition CACSP Halftime 30 on Thursdays training webinar series. These bi-monthly webinars focus on hot topics related to the CACSP meal pattern requirements. Webinars are held on the third Thursday of every other month in English from 2 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time and in Spanish from 3 to 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. The next webinar will be held on Thursday, July 18th, and the topic will be serving vegetables in the CACSP. This webinar will give an overview of the vegetables requirement in the CACSP and showcase fun, creative, and appealing ways to offer vegetables at meals and snacks in the CACSP. Registration is now open at the URL at the bottom of the slide. There will also be a CACSP halftime webinar on September 19th that will spotlight different tools that CACSP providers can use to determine amounts of grains to serve to meet meal pattern requirements. Those who attend the entire 30-minute webinar will receive a certificate of participation. And the National CACSP Sponsors Association, NCA, offers participants the opportunity to submit and track continuing education credits. Additionally, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics Commission on Dietetic Registration has also approved this webinar for 0.5 hours of continuing professional education units. Recordings of previous CACSP halftime webinars are also available at the web address on the bottom of the slide and available for continuing education credit. I'm now going to turn it over to Lucy. Thank you so much, Francia. Um, I'm so happy to be here this afternoon. Today I'll be sharing how to apply some adult learning styles to enhance your in-person trainings. 
I'm going to be sharing what has been working well at the uh, in here in Maryland in our CACP training program. Uh, a little bit about myself. I've been working at MSCE for the last year and a half as their CACFP training specialist. My background is in early childhood education. I have been a director of a child care center, family home provider. I've administered the CACFP program in several different child care facilities, and I also teach classes at um, all the community colleges to early childhood providers here in Maryland. During my presentation, I'm going to share with you four adult learning styles and how they've been applied in Maryland's face-to-face -face CACP trainings with our various CACFP audiences. I'm going to describe promising practices from Maryland CACFP trainings. And we have implemented these strategies in lots of our trainings, including the Teen Nutrition Training Grant activities, our yearly administrative meetings, and our CACFP basics training, um, which is a training that is for new child care um, providers who are new to the program or staff who are brand new or people who have compliance issues. So these are all these techniques that we have implemented within all of our training programs. A little bit, um, a little bit background on Maryland. This is my beautiful state of Maryland. Maryland is a mid-Atlantic state. We have 24 counties. Its largest city, Baltimore, has a long history of a major seaport. We have 265 CACFP child care center agencies, and they serve 505 child care center sites. We have seven CACFP family child care home sponsors, and they serve approximately 2,700 family homes. For adult daycare centers, we have 95 agencies that serve 155 adult sites. The way we provide our trainings in Maryland is mostly using face-to-face -face trainings within large and small group settings regionally throughout the state. We also recently started a CACFP peer advisory team who helps with advising on our trainings and our training needs. We work closely with the Office of Child Care to provide core of knowledge credit to all of our participants, and those core of knowledge credits go toward their child care license. So in today's training, we're going to discuss the four types of learning styles and relate them back to how we are being applied in our Maryland in-person CACFP trainings. This is all based on the VARC learning model for adults. And um, if you tuned in last at the last webinar, this learning model was discussed in the previous webinar. But now we're going to discuss how, it's, uh, how it is applied to our face-to-face -face trainings. So a little overview of the VARC learning styles. For our visual learners, this typical visual learner prefers to read information in a textbook or on a whiteboard rather than listen to a lecture. Visualization techniques help them remember things. They often enjoy doodling and drawing, and they use this as a study tool. They like colors, they different formats, different fonts to emphasize in different points. They really like this graph that we're showing right now. Um, they follow instructions better when they can see a demonstration first rather than just to be told how to do something. So again, they like those maps and graphs. And again, this graph is a perfect example for our visual learners. Our auditory learners, these are all the people who are really enjoying this webinar right now. They have a strong preference for information that is heard or spoken. They learn best from lectures, group discussions, radio, email, using mobile phones. Now, I know I said email here. Um, people are like, well, it's not reading and writing. But typically, um, the reason why email is associated here is because typically email is often written in the chat style with abbreviation, slang, and non-formal language. Our auditory learners like to talk out loud as well as talk to themselves. Often people with this preference want to sort out things by speaking first. They may say again what has already been said or ask an obvious and previously answered question. They're not trying to annoy you. They really are just trying to figure out the information themselves. They need to say it to themselves, and they learn through saying things. Our reading and writing preference, this preference is for information displayed as words. Not surprisingly, many teachers and students have a strong preference for this mode. Being able to write well and read widely are attributes that are sought by employers. This preference emphasizes text-based input and output, so they love reading and writing in all their different types of forms. These people are addicted to the PowerPoint. Um, they love the internet, um, dictionaries, and anything that's words, words, words. Um, they love Google and Wikipedia. And now for our most popular learning style is our kinesthetic learners. 
They love to anything that is um, experience and practice in real life. So the kinesthetic preference is a very popular mo modality, but participants need to use the information learned in trainings within 30 days or 90% of that training will be lost. Again, these participants need to use that information as soon as possible. This includes demonstrations, um, simulations, videos, and movies of real things. So again, the whole topic of kinesthetic is if it can be grasped, held, tasted, or felt, it needs to be included for our kinesthetic learners. So every training should accommodate as many types of learning uh, learners as possible but without being overwhelming. While some people strongly prefer one of the four learning types, most adults are a blend of these learning styles, making them multimodal learners. When we talk about this preference of learning style, we also understand that no one type fits all. All right, so we have a question to ask you. I'm curious, as a learner, which adult learning style fits you best? And since we're mostly, um, we would like to have two, at least two. So please choose at least two of the uh, learning styles. Oh, I see kinesthetics going up. It's awesome. <gasps> Visual and kinesthetic are going up. <laughs> the results are coming in. This is wonderful. A lot of our visual learners out there. Excellent. So visual learners are, are it's the highest preference right that. And it makes sense too. They like to read materials and see the visualized information. And then the next highest one was, is our kinesthetic learners. Awesome. Thank you. So as for a successful trainer, you need to implement as many strategies to ensure participants understand and retain that information. So those are what we call multimodal trainings. And for one example of a multimodal training activity that Maryland used is, is our, our implementation of our CACSP program videos. These are videos are real life demonstrations and real life examples of what is going on within our CACSP. We used, um, we were able to develop these videos by um, using the Maryland 2015 Team Nutrition Training Grant. And the four training videos are the CACSP Mealtime Environment, the CACFP meal pattern, what is a standardized recipe, and how to use a standardized recipe. All of our videos can be accessed through our eatsmartmaryland.org website, and we use these um, videos throughout training, either for either pre-work or during our, um, um, during our trainings, we use it to emphasize certain points. We also, to include, to kind of reach out our reading and writing learners and our kinesthetic learners with the videos, we create these training video guides that go along with our videos. The use of the video guides are tailored toward a reading and writing learner preference, and since the video and video guides are tied directly to real life applications, our kinesthetic learners are taking in that information as well. We have our participants either complete this during training or before they arrive at the training. Another example of a multimodal training activity we use is the utilization of our job aids. We developed these job aids under our 2015 Team Nutrition Training Grant. Our visual learners take in the information from the job aids with the visualization of the pictures, graphs, and highlighting important language. The reading and writing preference learners take in the information by reading the job aids. So what we do in our face-to-face CSAP basics trainings we have used these job aids in small group discussions by parents and participants in groups and having them complete an activity related to point of service or choosing the correct milk type. We then share with the group. This is yet another multimodal training strategy called Think, Pair, Share. This collaborative learning strategy improves participants' understanding of the material, cooperation with their peers, and expression of ideas. These small group discussions are needed for our auditory learners and the practicing the skill of taking point of service and claim consolidation are all geared to our kinesthetic learners as well. Another example of our multimodal training examples is our use of our, our um, scavenger hunts uh, within our programs. We do understand that Typically, when we hand out a, a guide, they, there's a maybe a 50-50% chance they're going to actually read the entire guide. 
And um, adults rely heavily on their previous experience and background um, versus on others' experience and background. So in order to get them to ha into these, um, these handbooks and to make them feel more confident in the program, we created a scavenger hunt. Um, for these scavenger hunt activities, we pair the participants up in small groups of two to four people to complete the activity together and is another great example of think, pair, share. This allows for the discussion needed about the topics for our auditory learners and allows others to discuss best practices and concerns in a small group setting before sharing with a large group. Our kinesthetic learners love the hands-on opportunity to get into the material and relate it to their day-to-day -day operations. Our visual learners are attracted to the images and graphs in the handbooks and the organization of the scavenger hunt. In the scavenger hunt, there are also sections where the participants need to highlight important points, which accommodates our visual learners as well. In the end, participants have a take-home, self-created summary of the handbook. Another example of when we used multimodal learning strategies was during our 2018 six-hour face-to-face annual CSCFP child care center administrative trainings. We held 18 of these regional trainings throughout Maryland. A large focus of this training was focused on the understanding and implementing the CACFP meal pattern. The multimodal training tool we developed and used in these trainings was a meal pattern workbook completed by participants. The Meal Pattern Workbook is a training tool that has participants use as many effective learning uh, modalities to absorb the material without overwhelming the learner. So let me describe the workbook and process to you a little bit more in detail. The participants were divided into small groups of six to seven people to complete a CACFP workbook together. Each group was assigned to a component of the MyPlate and then rotated every 20 minutes. Participants need about, you should change your modality about every 15 to 20 minutes um, to help with, uh, with the learning styles. But the workbook was color coded as well as the tables, and this is accommodating our visual learners and to organize the information in compartments. The workbook was colorful and used pictures and graphs to organize information. There was a table assigned to each component of my plate, and each table contained all the answers to the workbook and each group needed to use the information in the workbook and the tables to answer the questions inside the workbook. We utilize MSDE and USDA training tools, such as the meal pattern charts, menu planners, and resources to identifying serving sizes, sugar limits, and credible foods. This activity has a high kinesthetic reference as the information they were seeking related to hands-on activities that were practical in the CACFP operations. We're going to get in a little detail about what the, this workbook looks like. So again, here is all the five tables that were separated by, by the components, and here's the grain section. We used the USDA train, um, Sugar Requirement Training Guide to have them um, look at four different types of cereals, and they would circle which ones met the sugar requirements. And this is the grain, the grain section here. All right, so we wanted to test your own meal pattern knowledge, and then we wanted to ask you, which age groups may be served 1% milk? Is it one to two years, three to five years, six to 12 years, three to five years, and six to 12 years? See if people know their stuff. <laughs> Excellent, excellent, that's wonderful. Excellent job. So that's perfect. And that your correct answer is three to five to six to 12 years. Excellent job. Uh, one way that we, tr we went ahead and we tried to um, give this information out to um, is through our meal pattern workbook. In the milk section here, they had, they had to also identify what type of milk would be served and what, what fat levels and what, what would be best for them. Also, we showed real life example of cup sizes, highlighting the serving size requirements. And then they also used the milk, like the soy milk and the almond milk and the lactate 
So they're able to determine nutritional equivalences on, based on plant-based milks, and they figured it out themselves why almond milk is not nutritionally equivalent. So that's how we did that in the workbook. Here's another example of the workbook and the training tools. This is the Meet Me alternate section on table where they were looking at yogurts and to figuring out whether the sugar limits were met. They were looking at a CN label and, um, and also the um, other it's product formulation statements to go for the Meet Me alternate section too. As part of our meal service training grants, we are conducting a menu planning part one, which we are incorporating into our annual six hour face-to-face -face 2019 child care center training. The menu planning part one training is approximately about two hours. And as part of the menu planning part one, we're focusing on minimum portion sizes using ounce equivalences. Then we focus on menu planning principles, pre-plated family style dining, cycle menus, budgeting, and evaluating your menus. So in this, um, on this slide, you'll see one of the worksheets that we have created and to find minimum portion sizes. And each step is highlighted to find a way to how much grains they need to serve using Exhibit A. And we have found that this has been really, really um, helpful and useful and to use not just for our trainings, but for our sponsoring organizations to go back and train their staff. This shows you exactly the making sure that they're meeting those minimum portion sizes and making sure the steps go through that as well. We want them to make sure they know how to do this. And then after assessing their, their comprehension and skills and the menu planning principles in the CACFP, we will move on to menu planning part two, which we will then take a more hands-on kinesthetic approach to learning by providing culinary and operation skills and standardized recipe trainings. Here's also an example of our menu checklist. The menu checklist is where um, we had all of our participants bring in their own menus, again, making this personal, and they use this menu checklist to check for compliance. And if things are not being met, they had the opportunity to ask why or ask for those questions during the training and then also to fix their menus uh, right there and then, so that we give that opportunity so they can leave with feeling more confident in their menu planning. In conclusion, so multimodal adult learning styles should be considered in all of your training activities. Adults learn from experience, and they, they rely heavily on their background and experiences when they come into these trainings. Remember that, we re that you want to create kind of a reaction to these trainings, because reactions to trainings leads to learning, and which, when learning leads to changes behavior, which then leads to results. Now, I also highly suggest utilizing all the resources that's created by the USDA and other states, connect to other states, to address the, all the different types of learning styles versus creating your own. All right, so next I'm going to um, uh, pass it off to Linda from Texas. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lucy, and thank you so much for a very informative presentation today. I want to welcome everyone again. So good afternoon. My name is Linda Simmons, and I am a nutrition specialist with the Texas Department of Agriculture. Uh, and I'm also very excited to be a part of this webinar today. So by the end of this short presentation today, I will have provided you with workshop exercises that you can use or edit that addresses each learning style, understand the importance of the trainer's role in communication and addressing barriers, evaluation activities that measure stated objectives, and post-training activities and tips to provide follow-up assistance for participants. So as I get started, I want to talk a little bit about um, our beautiful state of Texas and how we go about conducting and scheduling in-person training. As you can see, Texas is a huge state. We have close to 14,000 sites uh, in Texas, and that is a combination of child care centers, adult daycare centers, and daycare homes. 
And so in order to reach all of these, it's uh, sometimes an overwhelming task. So in Texas, in-person CACFP training occurs sometimes at our headquarters in Austin at the Texas Department of Agriculture, which I'll refer to as TDA. But the majority of our trainings occur at these 20 education service centers that you see here on the slide. And then sometimes we may travel to requested locations to train or give technical assistance. So what are ESCs, our education service centers? Well, Texas is unique because in 1967, the Texas legislature established 20 education service centers under the direction of the Texas Education Agency. TDA contracts with each of these 28 ESCs to provide training, technical assistance, and other services for CACSP operators and providers, as well as NSLP. ESCs are contracted to teach specific topics. Trainings are developed in collaboration by TDA and ESC subject matter experts. And training topics include, but are not limited to, meal patterns, menu planning, budget, procurement, and food buying guides. Trainings routinely last two to five hours, and the trainers have the latitude to adjust hours to fit the needs of the participants. ESC nutrition consultants receive training, input, guidance, and leadership from TDA headquarters at least two times yearly. Each ESC has their own website where, classes, where class schedules are posted. CACSP sites can register for the classes, and they do not have to be in their particular region. They can uh, sign up and register for any of these 20 education service centers. As you might expect, there's great collaboration between our ESC uh, and sometimes combining forces and offering trainings, and sometimes even having like all-day trainings on Saturday where they offer a variety of trainings. And in some instances, uh, participants may have access to uh, remote, such as Zoom or Skype, or they may be able to enter the classroom in that, in that capacity also. So I'm going to be talking about some training methodology and learning styles, instructor-led, interactive, hands-on, and blended training. And so we're going to take a look at each one of these. Uh, and I'm going to give some specific examples of what actually happens in our, uh, our on-site training. So instructor-led training methods is one that is very common to everyone. It's an ideal approach that, that most people are comfortable with. It delivers the required skills in real time, and everyone can see exactly what is being taught. Many people have had basic classroom training since childhood and will quickly acquire the trained skills. In this situation, whiteboards, blackboards, videos, PowerPoint presentations are all found in this approach. It is perfect for large groups as everyone understands the skills at the same time, and it also is cost effective. And this is the method that we use mainly when I'm talking about having trainings at our headquarters in Austin, uh, which would be our state conferences, staff meetings. Uh, we usually use this instructor-led uh, training format. Interactive training. Interactive training features quizzes, case studies, small group discussions, question and answer sessions, role play, and demonstrations. One advantage of interactive training is that it helps participants clearly understand the message or what is being trained. It also keeps everyone engaged and no one is left behind. So now I'm going to give two examples of interactive uh, training and interactive activities that we actually use uh, in some of our um, in-person workshops. And one is smartphone bingo, and the other one is called roll the dice. So in our smartphone bingo, this is a vegetable subgroup bingo. It's a game that participants play on their smartphones during the menu planning class. The purpose of this activity is to get menu planners to think about all the different types of vegetables they can incorporate into their menus and to realize the importance to serve vegetables in a rainbow of color because they contain different nutrients necessary for growth and development. The participants scan the code or enter the URL, which you see here on the slide, uh, into their phone. And if they don't have a phone, then we provide printed copies 
um, of the information so that they can play along. The participants have the vegetable subgroup handout to look at, which is seen here in the middle of the slide. The instructor then calls out a letter and a color, and the participant has to find a vegetable from that group under that letter. So for example, if you see bingo up at the top, so the instructor might call out I, other. So the participant would look under I, and then they would have their subgroup chart there that they can look at. And so they'll look at all the other vegetables in, on the chart, and then they're going to select one that would be um, in that row. So this particular person selected cucumbers. When, as you go through the game, you can bingo in any direction, uh, backwards, forward, uh, side to side. And so sometimes they'll uh, be strategic in the vegetables that they're selecting so that they can bingo. It's a fun activity using technology, and of course, prizes are given to the winners. Uh, most of our prizes are uh, team nutrition uh, materials and resources, as well as resources that we develop here um, at TDA. And our other interactive uh, game that we play is called Roll the Dice. Here, the trainer creates a round table at the back of the classroom. And at two different times during the workshop, the participants move to the round table and take turns passing around a dice that has questions on all sides. Whoever rolls the dice answers the question that is face up based on their experience, which is key in adult learning because they love to share their experiences and resources. So picture here on the slide is a template of the dice. And this particular uh, training um, was a training on procurement. And so some of the questions uh, read, how does inventory impact procurement contracts? And what is your facilities receiving process? However, you can change the questions uh, to be based on any workshop topic that you might be training on. Uh, and it's a great interactive tool, and we have had very positive feedback evaluations from this particular activity. Hands-on. Hands-on training is a method used to help teach people a certain task. It provides real-world experiences by allowing the participants to get their hands directly on whatever they are learning and create a sense of empowerment. A trainer is available to work with the participant to provide guidance rather than leaving the participant on his or her own to figure out what needs to be done. So when possible, we do ask our participants to bring their own documents to evaluate. And so the first example that I'm going to give you is a verbal example. So in our budget workshop, um, we ask the participants to bring their actual budget and expenses. Laptops are provided at the Education Service Center so they can uh, access their budget. And then the trainer provides an example of how to determine percent variance between budgeted amounts and the actual expense. And then the participant has the opportunity to evaluate their own percent variances if desired. And this next slide um, is another hands-on activity. I uh, hear the trainer created 10 scenarios on large posters. And the posters are hung on the training room walls. Participants were asked to answer them as a pretest. And then they could get up and change their answers at any time during the workshop. Trainers also provided specific times for them to reevaluate. Here we see a picture of the pre-workshop poster and then again at the end. And it can be used as a pre and post test, but it's actually also a formative assessment because they could change their minds at any point during the workshop. So as you see here, this is um, also our procurement uh, training. There's a scenario about what type of solicitation um, that this particular center might want to use for purchasing goods. So the question was asked, is this an invitation for bid or is this a request for proposal? And so as you see in the beginning, the pre, uh, each participant had a different colored uh, sticky. And so most of the participants thought it was invitation for bid. But if you look at the post and after they received information, and after they had had hands-on practice and talking about different types of solicitation for procurement, 
you see that most of them moved their answers to request for proposal. Again, a very um, interactive uh, tool and one, again, that our participants really do enjoy. So it's time to test our knowledge. So what is blended learning? Is blended learning instructor-led, interactive, combining traditional classrooms face-to-face -face with online digital media? media, online learning, or none of the above. And so if you're going ahead and put in your answer, and as you see here, uh, it says uh, we have most of them uh, saying that blended learning is traditional classroom online. None of the above, interactive. So um, it's actually a combination of traditional classroom as you're talking about, and then online, face-to-face. -face. So everyone did a great job, um, and almost 100%. So here's our slide on blended learning. Uh, blended learning, yes, is a combination of, of all of the methods that we have been speaking of. So blended learning is a formal or informal education or training program in which participants learn in part through delivery of content and instruction via digital and online media with some element of the, particip of the participant in, in control over time, place, path, or pace, while still attending a face-to-face -face in-person classroom with a teacher or trainer that can assist. Um, so methods are combined with computer-mediated activities. And actually, most of our trainings here in Texas are some type of a blended training, uh, which you kind of saw from some of the um, activities and examples that I've already talked about. So one more polling question. This one is true or false. The most important element in a training situation is the trainer. So go ahead and select your answer. Let's get the results. And most of you overwhelmingly said false. So let's go to the next slide. The most important element in a training situation and in person is the trainer. And one of the reasons why the trainer is the most important element is because Trainings involve teaching and of new skills, uh, whether methods and procedures. The trainer must be enthusiastic, energetic, and genuinely interested in both the subject and getting his or her message across, and will evoke the greatest response from the participants when the trainer does this. The trainer has to be flexible and try to, to gauge their audience prior to and throughout the training in order to assess and meet their needs. The trainer must understand the needs of the adult learner, which Lucy spoke to in her presentation. But again, some of those is that the adult learner wants to control their learning, wants immediate gratification, focuses on issues that, that concerns them. Uh, they want to test their learning as they go. And the adult learners come to the table with a wealth of experience and resources that they wish to share. So the, the trainer in, in person has to carry a lot of burden on their shoulders in order to make it a su successful training. This is a very uh, famous quote about effective communication from George Bernard Shaw. And it says that the problem with communication is the illusion that it has been accomplished. So communication specialists compare the way people communicate to the way a radio transmission takes place. That is to say, the transmitter, which is the trainer, the message, which is the content, and the receiver, which is the participant. And you see this, this model used throughout communication uh, training. So communication has three types of transmission. We have the spoken by the trainer. So the trainer has to know their information, know the objectives, read their audience, uh, and be prepared to make changes. Uh, based upon their audience and their audience's needs. And then we have written transmissions. 
So this could be anything from participant workbooks to worksheets uh, to recipes to any type of information in a workbook where they may be writing information. Uh, so any type of written communication. And then gestures. Sometimes we really don't think about body language, but sometimes it's what you don't say that counts. So body language and nonverbal communication. So again, this goes back onto the trainer, that the trainer has to be interested and, uh, and be interactive with the participants in the training. So when we look at some of the ineffective communication methods, uh, we may have uh, the trainer ramble the transmission, meaning that the contents of the message are not in logical order and they often appear unrelated. And then overloading the message. Uh, sometimes overloading the message can lead the participant to be confused or fatigued or cause anxiety. And the trainer may use words or terms or expressions unknown to the participant and therefore causing a wrong language. And what does an effective communicator do or an effective trainer? They use their voice effectively. They know the subject matter. They prepare the message carefully. They arrange points logically. They use simple words and sentences. They avoid slang. Displays interest and enthusiasm. Is convincing and sincere. And uses examples such as visual media and graphics to illustrate key points. The trainer also has to overcome language and cultural differences. So when possible, offer trainings, when you can, offer trainings and resources in different languages. We're very fortunate in Texas that we have bilingual trainers in some of our ESCs, and so we can offer some uh, trainings in different languages. And then the statements here, cultures tend to communicate in different ways. Our cultures may have learning goals may be different. So you may have participants that may challenge the trainer, and then you may have participants that would never challenge the trainer because of their culture. And then you may have participants that don't want to be singled out and don't want to be called on and would never raise their hand and ask a question. So the trainer has to be picking up on all of these cues through a face-to-face -face training. And so one of the things that the trainer cannot do the trainer cannot make assumptions that the message is understood. So if, if someone never voices that they don't understand or they never raise their hand, uh, the trainer has to uh, be reading their uh, participants and trying to be sure that everybody uh, is understanding the message that the trainer is communicating. Evaluations of skills taught. Uh, you must find out what was communicated properly. Checking this might also introduce you to views of your listeners that were not apparent or that you might reveal misunderstandings that need to be corrected quickly. In addition, checking often helps listeners feel involved and that they're being consulted and that their responses might uncover some problems that were not apparent to you. So then we want to look at evaluation methods uh, after the training is completed. Here on the slide we've already talked about. Um, some of the things that we do during the training to check their learning as they go through the training. But here we want to talk about uh, at the end of the training. So here we might have a vegetable cycle that the participants can write down all the vegetables maybe from the smartphone bingo game and can take this with them. Another food activity is where uh, you can have food uh, that are credible and non-credible for any meal pattern that you're teaching, and then the participants can place them behind the correct labels, and then you can discuss placements or correct misplacements. Uh, we do play a reverse Jeopardy game uh, in our some of our trainings. Uh, this one happens to be in the infant creditable um, uh, foods also. We call it reverse because here we ask the question and they answer instead of giving the answer and them giving you the question. So it's a very popular interactive game, and so the question will come up. Um, and then if it isn't a credible food, they'll have an X. If it is, they'll have a check mark. Uh, and then you can go on, they can go on and go to the next category and play through the entire game. 
Then we have our exit tickets for our cycle menu classes. Here is where participants bring their own um, menus and then through the menu cycle, uh, they update their menus to include um, all the required elements for a reimbursable meal as well as best practices. They must complete an evaluation form and receive their certificate of completion, which then validates their clock hours for child care licensing, uh, or they may have for their uh, quality uh, assurance rating system here in Texas known as the Texas Rising Star. And then lastly, our post-training follow-up and technical assistance. So how do we follow up with our participants that have been to our training? Well, here on this slide, we see ways that we can uh, follow up or give them information before they leave uh, the training. When they have their administrative review is one way that we know that we have gotten messages across in all of our trainings. Uh, we can, uh, this, this slide is mailed to them after the reimbursable meals for infants. And these are live links that they can click on and check their learning. And then lastly, uh, Padlet. I don't know if you're familiar with Padlet or not, but Padlet is what I would call the modern, uh, modern parking lot. Uh, and after class, a link can be sent to the participants to, ex uh, to access and there they can post additional questions, share knowledge, and network with one another. And here is just a screenshot uh, of the Padlet screen of where uh, participants and the trainer are asking questions and are interacting with one another. So that ends my presentation today. I hope that we can stay connected through um, using our website. So our website is for meals. I certainly invite you to uh, browse it and look at our resources and learn more about our CACFP program in Texas. And now I will turn it back to Francille. Thank you both, uh, Lucy and Linda, for such engaging presentations. We appreciate it. We're now at the portion of the webinar where we are going to do the Q&A. So if you haven't already, if you could type your questions in the chat box. And while you all are typing your questions, I'm just going to give a few housekeeping reminders. After the Q&A portion of the webinar, a post-webinar survey will pop up on your screen. We encourage you to answer the questions that will uh, encourage you to think about the information you heard today and how you might be able to apply it in your CACFP site or in trainings that you are planning. Those of you attending the webinar for the entire hour today will receive the certificate via email by the end of the day on July 10th. Please wait until after July 10th and check your spam or junk mailboxes before reaching out to us about your certificate. If you are viewing the webinar with multiple people, you can print out a certificate for each person. For those of you who want to submit or track continuing education with NCA, you can do that um, at this link, www.cacfp.org backslash resources backslash trainer circle. And continuing education uh, professional units have been approved from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics Commission on Dietetic Registration, and certificates are available upon request through the Team Nutrition inbox. And that email address is teamnutrition at usda.gov. This webinar is being recorded and the full webinar will be made available on the Team Nutrition website at a later date. And if you are watching this as a recorded webinar and want to receive a certificate, you can go to the National CACSP Sponsors Association website. I'll give it one more time, www.cacsp.org backslash resources backslash trainer circles to complete the post-webinar practice questions and then receive a certificate.
So we have a few questions that have come into the chat box. Uh, the first one is directed to both of our presenters, so I will ask you first, Lucy. Okay. Which training activity have participants found most engaging? Okay, so um, recently when we actually, when we did the milk um, with the, we had the almond milk and we got the, and all the different types of milk that are popular at right now that are not actually um, nutritionally equivalent. And so we had, we got actually what is inside milk, all the nutrition equivalences with them. And then they actually sat there and, and did a comparison between the two. And we received a ton of feedback for that because now the providers are able to explain to parents why one or the other doesn't meet and why the one, and they were really, they were very shocked at some of those answers. So, you know, any kind of opportunity where they can get those hands on and use real life examples, um, but the milk one was a big one for us. Thank you, Lucy. And Linda, I'm gonna ask you the same question. Um, which activity in your trainings has been most engaging for participants? Well, one of the most engaging activities is our uh, reverse Jeopardy game because it's actually played in teams and so it's like a competition. So they get very involved in, with their teams and wanting to get the correct answers and answering them correctly. So the Jeopardy game is probably one of our most uh, engaging and also teaches them at the same time about the infant meal pattern which is a, a difficult meal pattern to learn uh, so when we can get them excited and in a competitive game uh, and answering the questions um, it's a lot of fun to watch and a lot of fun to be a part of thank you uh, we have another question that has come in uh, what has been the most challenging CACFP topic to train on thus far? Uh, I'll direct it first to Lucy and then to Linda. Okay, so I'm thinking the minimum portion sizes using Exhibit A or Exhibit A in general um, and how to use that tool and also the whole grain rich requirements. You know, we had, we, that's why we broke it down into steps and we also have a whole grain rich tool that we use, which breaks down the steps one by one to kind of break down the complicated information. But that's been the most challenging um, CFP topic so far for us. Thank and, you. And Linda, and, same question. Okay. Um, well, in Texas, uh, definitely the same. And uh, what Lucy just said, we definitely have numerous uh, questions on whole grain rich uh, and providing uh, training and technical assistance. But the other one um, that we train on that, we've, that we find is uh, somewhat challenging and that is procurement. And so as you saw, I gave some, several examples uh, in my training, uh, activities that we use and questions that we ask. So I would have to say that procurement is also uh, a very challenging subject to teach for us here in Texas. Thank you, Linda. We've had a few questions in the chat box about um, how you can receive your certificates. We will be sending certificates to everyone to the email address that they use in registering for the webinar. So that will be coming to you. Uh, and then you can request continuing education cre credits for um, CDR if you need to through our team nutrition at usda.gov email address. And another question we've had a couple of times is um, basically if any of the resources that you all shared today are available on your website. So um, Lucy, if you could share um, what you all have accessible um, on the Maryland website? Yes, um, so our Maryland website is in current development, but we, right now we have the training videos, the resources on there. Um, I know that the workbook is, ha has been at the National um, CSCP Conference, the Nutrition Conference. They have that available on their, on their app. Um, but um, right now, really, it is kind of those resources are, are kind of more internally. But if anybody's ever interested, then we would, you know, reach out to us and we can help you with that. 
Thank you. And Linda, can you share if, if any of the um, resources you shared are available on the Texas Department of Agriculture um, website? Oh, well, we do have some of the resources available on, on squaremills.org, and um, you can uh, search those through CACSP and then resources. And then some of the other training activities uh, we can make available, but you would need to contact, uh, contact me uh, at the email that is listed on my title slide, and we could provide those. Thank you both. Um, what we're going to do actually is in our post webinar email to everyone, we can include the links to both of the state agency websites um, so you can see what they have available. And um, as they have both said, you can reach out to them directly if you are interested in more. Uh, that's all the time we have for the webinar today. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we look forward to having you all again on September 12th for our next CACSP Trainer Circle webinar. Thank you and have a great day.